Welcome back to the No Mulligans podcast, where it's just me and Scott today. No Tate, but uh, if you guys get a chance and you're watching this on YouTube, uh, or even if you're listening to this on Apple Podcasts, why don't you just leave like a nice like thank you, Tate, in the comments? Because he's really been putting in some some awesome work recently with editing the podcast and being behind the board so that it can just like be you and me talking, which I was actually playing with um, one of my buddies yesterday who just joined the River Club, and we were sitting down at the bar, and, and I was talking to him a little bit about the podcast, and I said, I kind of just gave myself a promotion with Tate being here, because like I don't have to, <laughs> yeah. I can just sit here and be like yeah. with you and talk. That's so good. Yeah, no, that's <laughs> funny. Um, you know, the other thing, we need to thank Avery, so if you're seeing yeah. clips kind of pop through on social and stuff, um, a lot of that is Avery and Tate behind the scenes, back of the house, without even our involvement. Like, they're picking the clips um, and really putting some awesome stuff to them. And so I'm, we're both pretty excited about that, and we're getting some traction in social. Like, really trying to impact more people, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, it's not about us. It's not, you know, it's about – we do this because it's fun for both of us. Right. It's, uh, in some ways, it's therapeutic. If you listen to the last episode, I was pretty animated, man. Like, I was amped up um, really about, you know, taking charge of your golf game and building a golf swing around your particular style of learning and how you feel and how you move. And so, like, For sure. you know, it's a big passion of what we do. I want you to have control of your outcome. So, um, <clears throat> you know, lots of things have transpired in the last two weeks since we shot the last podcast we right. have you're wearing the master's hat i know i was about to say with the topic that we're talking about today we should kind of um thread in some master's talk yeah and i think well. we i think we have to talk about live have to talk about live have to talk about our takes as well uh obviously i picked rory because it would be cool to see him get that grand slam and uh miss the cut so i was cheering so hard for sam bennett yeah. Oh, yeah. Because we've talked Who about this on the podcast. Who wasn't? Um, for me, and obviously I have more context, but like for me, I'm going, how, are we past the time where an amateur can win a PGA mm. Tour event? And I think what we saw is, no, we are not past that time. Yeah, I would agree. Uh, I th- it's unlikely, um, but I was pulling to see it. I would love to see that in my lifetime. Actually, the last one did happen in my lifetime, but I was four years old uh phil mickelson in 1991 yeah and then uh the first one that an amateur one was in 1945 um so and i believe there's only been five amateurs to ever win a pga tour event that's cool man yeah it, it was awesome watching him swing um swing it over there in augusta this past week just because first of all he's got such a unique swing it's oh, super yeah. out to in oh yeah and uh, I'm going to find something. Uh, Keep talking. This is good. No, it's super out to end. But when you see him just sling it around there, I think the one thing that was impressive to me, and especially when we're talking about amateurs, is we always think like, oh, they're just not as good as the pros, right? They just can't strike it as yeah. well. They're just yeah. not as good, right? But what I was really impressed about is that he was playing in the final group on Saturday. And maybe it got to him a little bit on Saturday, but on Thursday and Friday, man, like his mindset was just like, I can play with these guys. And I think that's what was most impressive is just his mindset going through with it. And a lot of that had to do with his dad as well, with um, his dad oh, passing yeah. away early from, from uh, was it Alzheimer's? Yep. I think it was early onset uh, Alzheimer's. And so he had this tattoo on his, on his left hand, and it said, uh, don't wait to do something, pops. And it was the last thing that uh, the last note that he wrote him before he passed, apparently. And so I think that just really stuck with him throughout the entire tournament was being like, you know what? Like, I can hang with these guys if I'm going to be playing with these guys in a few short years. So, you know, why not make a statement now? Why not? Really cool why to see. not do it? Yeah. Why not do it now? I, I think that's really neat. Um, <clears throat> I think a couple of things, you know, Sam Bennett really brought out a lot of things to the surface that I think have been coming to the surface uh, for the industry as a whole. Um, I think the Talus Performance Institute has been a part of some of this change, uh, but is uh, we've been talking about this for a long time, right? Like the only thing that matters is where the ball ends up. And the only thing that matters for that is if you can repeat the club being in that position. It really doesn't matter how you get it done. Yeah. And um, I posted on my social um, one of his quotes that was from Golf dot com said, uh, "I don't have 190 ball speed. I don't have a pretty swing like some of the other amateurs." It's golf, not a golf swing. 
I've done the right things this week. I was prepared. Here I sit with a chance to do something special on the weekend. And he still did. Like, even though he shot over par, he still did something special. And, you know, I think that's really neat, and I think that says a lot about him. But that's what we've that's what we've been trying to do. And that was the passion on the last podcast was, like, we can do it this way. Like, there's a better way to do this. Yeah, and I think what was even cooler is that um, I think it was cool that it was at Augusta, and here's why. Because Augusta National is such a coveted place in golf, I think yeah. that even if you're a pro yeah. and you're going there for the first time, the second time, third time, it doesn't matter what time it is, that place is always going to be special. So oh, I yeah. think you catch a lot of pros on their heels because they're trying to they're trying to do it because it's Augusta, right? Right. And so I when think you that's go why in Rory there, got stuck. Exactly. And so and and by only, the way, that's really freaking hard to not right, right, do right. that. And not only did Rory do that uh, and he got stuck, but I think there's even more added pressure because that's the last major he needs for his Grand Slam. So um, anyway, I say that as a credit to Sam Bennett because he went over there. Didn't care that it was Augusta. Didn't care that he was playing with a bunch of pros. He just went out there and did it. And I think that's just what was so magical to watch. Yeah, no, I I think that was something special. Um, you know, one of the other things, uh, so they lengthened the 13th hole. The scoring average on the 13th hole when they lengthened it this year, like, we're going to make it longer. They actually lowered the scoring average. Wow. Interesting. <laughs> because, like, they it's spent funny. Like, so we're going to make money. it longer. I was like, you just made it easier. Like, wait, how does that work, right? We're back to this whole deal that I've been trying to talk about for a while. Like, nothing in my data from BP and OPM POA has anything to do with how far a player hits the golf ball. Nothing. It's all angles. It's 100% angles and ball location. Like, that's yeah. that's it. Three data points. Like, that's what's super cool. And w- here's here's my take on it watching them play it. <clears throat> so, by lengthening the hole however many yards, 30, 40, 50 yards, um, you put them in a situation where if they they're not going to be as close, right? Let's let's even say they're only 20 yards further away. You're not putting them in a spot where it's like, okay, one of two things. I've either got to lay up, play a wedge on. By the way, these guys are insanely good with their wedges. Or B, <clears throat> when I go for it with Ray's Creek right there along the right-hand side, when I go for it, because I have a longer club in my hand and because the dispersion pattern is wider with that longer club in my hand, guess where I'm going to bias it? I'm going to bias it further left. So let's say I've got a four iron in instead of a six iron. right? I'm more likely to bail left with the four iron because the chance of it going in the water is higher. Whereas with the six iron, I'm likely to take on a little more risk to try to get it close, and I'm going to drop it in Ray's Creek. So in so doing you actually force them into more conservative of a strategy and you avoided the hazard like Ray's Creek wasn't even a hazard at this point you basically eliminated Ray's Creek by making the hole longer you made a mistake in lengthening the hole it didn't need to be lengthened yeah i think that they needed they needed a tournament run at it to prove it though cuz i think on oh, paper I, I it agree. did look good i i agree yeah i agree and but it's like wait they scored lower this year crap that didn't work. Yeah. It's How like much you, money did we spend to do that? Yeah. Well, you're <laughs> talking about that. So just the property, because uh, apparently Augusta National and Country Club of Augusta, or Augusta Country Club, whatever they call it, back right up to each other. And so uh, that 35-yard that margin that was originally Country Club of Augusta's property costs Augusta National $4 million, just that 35 square yards right there. I, I think what's funny about that, like – I when I heard that, um, I thought I think it'd be so cool to see what the headline would have been in like the local newspaper. Augusta National builds new tee box. Augusta Country Club redoes their whole golf course. <laughs> you know, like yeah, yeah. we we did redid the whole thing. You guys build a new tee box. We redid the whole thing. You know, that'd just be a hilarious like tagline not only that but uh i think i don't i don't think you told me this i think it was uh one of my buddies at work but said that what they did was they uprooted all of those trees kept them alive and replanted them around the tea box in order to make it look like that tea box has been there for the last 50 years you know how expensive that is oh my god you can only imagine like i bet it was another four million just to do all that I want to know like what special specialized crew is oh specialized in like just hey, tree arborists <laughs> large tree replanting you know yeah like what is 
I uh, just I don't know. It's no expense spared. Well, um, I do want to talk about thirteen a little bit more before we move on because I think there is something that we're forgetting here when we talk about OP, BPN, and POA. Mm-hmm. You you did explain it, but I, I kind of want to put it into layman's terms a little bit because if you have them look at their tee shot and then decide whether or not they want to go for it or lay up, a big thing with BPN is and, and POA is how close did you get it on your first attempt. Correct. Right? And so you could go for it. And, and get it out there, gonna be, and your proximity is going to be long, but you know, on first attempt. you know, you're going to be closer. You know, you're technically going to be closer to the hole, or you reduce that POA, that proximity on first attempt, by laying, laying up, up in the OP and then shooting over. So, I think that these guys actually would have scored, and definitely they did, but they scored better in their BPN and POA numbers on that hole than they did last year. Because they had to. Because they had to. But they did it subconsciously, which just further proves our theory about OPBP and POA that, that they, if you do take that approach, you're going to score lower. And, uh, you know, the scoring average on that hole told the story the last four days. Which I think is super cool, right? You know, those lengthening holes make holes harder. Yes. Does lengthening all holes make all no, holes harder? No. No. In some yeah. cases, it makes them easier. Yeah. Yeah. And in this case... This was a perfect storm, which I thought was super cool. I'm like, yeah. yes, you're proving my data right. You need to, uh, <laughs> you, need, you need to make a reel uh, about about 13 because I think that would really score well. Oh there. shoot, yeah, that'd be huge. Like, why 13 was what it was? To do the aerial like you've done with a few reels in the past, uh, pull it up. Be, yeah, yep. got to like, do it. Hey, here's it. what happened, and then leave this portion on the back end of the, of the deal. No, I think that'd be awesome. Yeah, it's um, it's pretty it's pretty special to see the data really work out really well. Yeah, and I think um, one thing that the 72nd hole did, um, specifically for John Rahm, I mean, you saw him hit that horrible tee shot and get, you know, I, an angel picked that ball from the air and put it back in the fairway. Like, that was unbelievable that he didn't have to play a, 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 a provisional shot. But, again, talking about OPBP and POA, like, you know, Rahm, you know, it was the obvious thing with a four-shot lead, but, you know, laying up, hitting that wedge close, and then – putting it in for par like that unbelievable was, that was like the just slamming the door shut like yeah i'm still the best player so but like rom dude especially over the past half season or you know or you know this whole season rom's just been excellent and i think one thing that you're seeing in this rom versus earlier rom is just a more composed figure and everybody's come out you more know, disciplined too. more disciplined but you know he's come out and talked about you know anger and why why am i not allowed to get angry and i think he's kind of leaned into that a little bit and really taken on not necessarily a villain role but just being like i don't care what people say about me like i'm the best player in he the world He was very stoic would be the term i would yeah use yeah experiment. but i think this was a, a a big coming out party for john rom for new john rom just because I feel like this is the guy. Like, at this point, man, like, at this point, I think Rom is probably the guy who's going to carry the weight of the PGA Tour yeah. over the next 10 years. Yeah, well, I, th- I think, too, um, I mean, right now, it's your your big three are Scotty, Rom, and McElroy. Scheffler, <sighs> Rom, and McElroy. They're your big three that are consistently winning. That are in contention almost every week. Can we talk about that for a second, though? Because I <laughs> love we got some controversies. Because I don't, dude. I just don't know about Rory anymore, man. Like, well, I, I get that he's insane. Like, he's you can't argue with his talent and his skill and what he can do. But, but I mean, he's just starting to become a Jordan Spieth a little bit in my mind. Like, I can see. That. I actually think he came out of that, and I think you're seeing a little. Wishy washy here. Is a little he recession in there. Yeah, yeah back in uh, old, but I, old I don't think it's. I don't think it's going back as far as it was. Um, I think some of the attention's been drawn away with all this live stuff, and he's kind of been the yeah. spokesperson. Yeah, yeah. Um, to his, I mean, they keep pummeling him with questions about it, so like he kind of is forced to answer. Uh, he's not. He doesn't have to answer, <clears throat> but he's chosen to. Um, but I think I think you mentioned. I think you hit the nail on the head here, though, with. Augusta is like this is the last one I need. It's a little bit like Phil never winning the Masters. Like yeah. Phil's never gonna win a Masters. Phil's never gonna win a Masters. Phil's never gonna win a Masters. Rory's getting that same message uh about him relative to the Masters, just like Phil did. So, you know, some hi- historical context 
what we may be seeing is the same repeat narrative of Phil Mickelson. That's all. Um, do you think, <laughs> I with think that there's being some of that. said, do you think he'll complete it at the end of the day? Because he's got to figure it out at some point. I just don't know if he's proved that, especially in recent majors. Yeah, I, I think there's a chance like this tournament, like trying so hard to win it because he is playing really well right now. He took third in the match play, and he dusted Scheffler in the – yeah, in the consolation match. But again, it's this it's this idea of this mindset that he has when he's going into these big tournaments. Man, it's like, yeah, you're one of the best in the world, but you know, going and beating an average Joe at a Muni is not is not getting it done on the biggest stage. And I think that's why we appreciate Tiger so much is because he was just yeah. unbreakable. Yeah, I still think they're your biggest. Your, your I, I don't. Three. I don't disagree with that. I just want to bring up a little controversy. <laughs> yeah. With, no. I, with that. I, yeah. I'm. I'm still going to keep them as your big three. I can see what you're saying. I think it makes some sense. I think time will play that out for us, and we'll have. We'll know. Um, but it's definitely. I mean, it's basically like the John Rom Scotty Scheffler show. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Which I mean, you couldn't pick two better guys to be the best yeah, in the world. Right two now. very. They're also showing that you were back to my first book. Um, one of the things that's really important is you have to play close to your strategy and so, um, or your personality. So you have to play close to your personality. If you don't play close to your personality, you're going to struggle. So like, I'm fairly conservative in nature when it comes to playing. So I need to play close to that and be aggressive in situations in which I feel comfortable being aggressive. And if I don't play close to that, I'm going to struggle. Also, in the same case, like Micah's here, and actually one of his teammates, who we'll talk about a little bit, uh, he came down and learned about BPN, OP, and POE yesterday. So by the time you hear this, it would have been like eight days ago. Um, but everybody's like, man, you're just so aggressive. You're just so aggressive. I was like, well, are you aggressive in everything you do? Well, yeah. I was like, okay, well, then that we need to play close to that. And we need to make sure you know how to stay aggressive but still hit your spots. And you can do that, but you can't <clears> – <throat> You can't play outside of your personality, and they're both very aggressive, but one's just like, hey, I'm like a little kid playing in the sandbox. The other guy's like, I'm building castles in the sand. You know, like yeah, that's John yeah. Rom. like, yeah. I'm going to build the world's biggest castle, and Scotty's over there just like piddling in like he's dug a big moat around a pile of sand and like, look, the water comes up. You know, just like that's how I kind of see them as – but both incredibly successful. I think what's cool about them too is that um, both of their swings are very unique as well. Like <laughs> Even more special. you could not be, it, it could not be a better time for golf than to have these two guys being number one and number two. And I think that's just showing people that there's more than one way to skin the cat at the end of the day. And like that's yeah. what we've always preached: is building a functional go golf swing, not a not a pretty golf swing per mm -hmm. se. And I just think it's uh, it's amazing to see. You know, Scheffler's footwork and John's quick trigger at the top, you know, like it's just – it's awesome to see, uh, I, especially for the new generation. Like looking at the two golf swings, I would feel a lot better about trying to teach and and swing. Like me personally, swing John Roms. I feel like I could control – again, I'm not being John Rom, but like conceptually, like that seems easier to control than Scotty's. Like, I'm like, dude, you're like pirouetting over here. And how are you getting – how do you even get the face on the ball, bro? Yeah, yeah. Like, that's unreal. Like, some of the swings that he makes, especially when he tries to shape some shots, I mean, he darn near falls down. Dude, I think I've got a little bit of ROM in my swing. Yeah, you do. Yeah, you do. With that short – that's kind of that short abbreviated backswing. Yep. Dude, I gave a lesson to a guy the other day, so this is totally – off the cuff. I haven't had one of these moments. No, that's yeah, great. I gave a lesson to the guy the other day. I was like, dude, you got to meet my podcast co-host. And he had just been picking up golf, kind of like you were at the time. And yeah. he had pitched. I said, you pitch in baseball? He's like, I, you know, I asked him what sports he played. He, and I had a suspicion he pitched. And so I asked, I was like, you pitched, didn't you? He said, yeah. And, of course, the next follow-up question is, how would you know? I was like, I don't know. I just, <laughs> I'm Scott. <laughs> like, I don't know. I just I just do. Um and I said, I want you to do this with your right hand and index finger. I had him do roll the top of the index finger over the top of the shaft. Just did these two fingers. Mm -hmm. And he, he had been slicing the ball when he showed up, just hitting these, like, draws. And, like, we were both giggling and dingling. It was a night and giggling and just, like, giddy excited. <clears throat> and he had booked a 90-minute initial swing. 
like evaluation. You had him in like what, fifteen minutes? Yeah, we were done in fifteen minutes. Yeah. <laughs> we got to get through his entire bag in the hour and a half. And even then it was like an hour in. I'm like, man, I'm bored. Like, what are we doing? I almost said, let's table the other thirty minutes for another time. But for sure. I, I know where to put him for the next three weeks. So <laughs> I was going, you know. But anywho, you know uh, Just picking up golf for the first time? I mean, he's kind of dabbled here okay. and there over the years, but not a serious player, sure. but becoming one. So um, that was a lot of fun, and he didn't know what to expect. And, I, you know, I never know who's going to walk in my door. Some are easier than others. And right. he was a great student, very malleable. If you think about Clay, you know, he's – I could be molded. And uh, we literally did everything right through through these two fingers for everything in his bag from his putting – all the way up through his driver. You know what I've learned it's recently? So incredible. Uh, I can't do that. I physically cannot personally control that. I can show it and demonstrate it, but I can't. What's interesting can't is um, as I've gotten further along with my swing is we've kind of transitioned from feeling everything in my in my hands where I do feel everything in my hands, but um, now it's been about controlling my lower body and the weight shift and everything. And so it's interesting because I do feel everything in my hands, but – as I'm getting more mature and, uh, you know, aging a little bit more in my golf game, it's just, it, it feels like now it's a, it's a weight play along with the, the hand feel. Well, you've moved from a white belt. I mean, you're moving up. Yeah. 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 You know, up the belt ranks. Fair um, enough. Which was super cool. But like, well, uh, speaking of that, like playing out here with Micah today, uh, we played, we got through, we got through 16 holes. Um, it was fun playing with him because he, you know, we we talk about strategy and, you know, I tried to follow him as best I can and I actually did a pretty decent job. But with him, it's funny because we're just, we're talking about VPNs and I'm just kind of like, you know, short right here, yeah? And he's like, yeah, I, I agree with that. He's like, man, I'm just going to start it here and, you know, let the ball draw at the target. And he can just do it. <laughs> and it's fun, and, you know. It's fun. He was a little, uh, you know, he was a little slow. Warming slow up. Slow start. Yeah, slow start. But uh, he shot two over on the front and then three under on the back and we don't we, we, we only got finish. to 16 yeah. so yeah. he probably would have put another birdie or two on the cards so um anyway it's just fun with him because uh playing with those guys it forces me to be better and it also forces me to think a little bit more strategically and there was times where i would hit bpns and he wouldn't and i would actually beat him on the hole and so right. it was cool especially right. on uh we were taught we were today on uh number seven and Okay. I we both we both striped our drives. I actually outdrove him, and we had like a hundred yards in. You were uh, so excited that you outdrove him too. I, like, I, I outdrove him like three times today, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I was definitely excited. He was like, "Oh, you got me on that one." And I was like, "No way!" Anyway, so we both had like a hundred yards in on on our second shot. He misses his uh, pins on the left today. He misses his deep deep and kind of above the hole. Yeah, so that BPN's front. Yep, and yep. then I missed mine on the front. And I had a like a chip on the fringe. Yep. Uh almost chipped it in and then tapped it in from about, you know, 8 inches for for a birdie. And he almost couldn't get it close. No. And he he mi he it barely misses the hole and then it trickles about 5 feet past and he missed his comebacker and he and he parred the hole. And so it's like it's funny how even though his POA was closer than mine, I still got him because right. I hit the BPN. Right. So to help those that are just kind of catching on to this, and we'll try yeah, and do a sure. little ten minute deal here on BPN, OP, and POA. So <clears throat> POA stands for proximity on first attempt. So everything is everything in these three data points is built on intent. If you lose that, you lose everything. So the only way to measure strategy is to measure intent. What did I intend to do? <clears throat> so I intend to hit the green. All right, we mark everything from there. So proximity on first attempt is really easy. If you go for a par five and two, hit it to hit it to 35 yards from the hole, mm -hmm. and then that's 105 feet. Yep. So that's your proximity on first attempt. Uh, if you punch out from the trees to 60 yards from the green, and you pitch that up to 12 feet, then Twelve feet is your proximity on first attempt. Now here's the here's the cruel part is let's say you're on a par five and you say you're gonna go for it. Like I'm going for the green here, it's you know, one you know, one ninety three. Let's say you duff it and it goes like forty yards up, well, your proximity on first attempt is that huge number. Yep. And yep. what that does is at the end of the round, when you're you know, elaborating on and, right. and digesting what you actually did in the round, 
it shows it. And a lot of people mm-hmm. say, well, the scorecard doesn't have pictures on it. Well, this is a way to add pictures to the scorecard Correct. and really measure the details. Correct. And, you know, one of the cool things tracking the data on the tour is, uh, especially now in the last year and a half where you can go back and see on TourCast, you can see the shot that was hit. Um, <clears throat> looking at even in 2021, if there were spots, I was like, well, that looks funny. Like, what happened there? Like, you hit a, see a tee ball over in trouble and then you'd see the ball like backwards behind him or to the side or like it didn't even get out in the fairway, it just kind of stayed in there. You're like, well, that's odd. And so then you go back and watch the tour cast and you can see him try to like the player kind of go for it, especially if it's like 170 yards. It looks like he's got like a five iron or something trying to hit a low punch and it hits a tree and rattles around and comes back down. Well, now he's got a 390 feet because he's 130 yards from the hole. <clears throat> and so that that impacts the data. And again, it's not about any one hole, right? But it's about patterns of behavior over time create an average. You play golf with your average shot. Scott Fawcett teaches that. Mark Brody teaches that. They're big stat gurus, right? We That's a accepted norm. However, there's more depth to that, and that's about intent. So that's proximity on first attempt. That's POA. Um, the value of that, so that you all have an understanding, is... Point zero zero five nine. Like, okay, so what does that mean? For each foot that you hit it further from the hole, it adds point zero zero five nine to your score. So if you hit it a hundred feet from the hole, that takes you to point five nine. It's a ha- it's basically a half a shot, right? So you don't hit it to a hundred feet from the hole. It takes you to a half a shot over par. <clears throat> so that's the value of that. So it's a very, very small value uh, on one hole. And then you have BPN. This is the kicker. This is like if you're listening to this and this is the first time you're hearing it, this is the this is the metric that you need to pay the most attention to. Yeah, it's it's the trademark. Yep. Um, and BPN stands for ball, pin, nearest edge. And what we mean by that <laughs> is... Let's say, for instance, Jack, just hold your arm up like this, like it's the edge of the green. So let's say this is the edge of the green. You, the viewers uh, that's watching this, this is the edge of the green. I'm holding my my (sighs) arm straight up right now, like at a right angle. And this is the flag, right? The flag's right here. Flag is on, like, my right side of my hand. Yep. So this is where the flag is. And then let's say the other edge of the green is where my microphone is. Yep, so the pen is in the middle of my hand and your mic. Yeah, but it's closer to your hand yep. than it is my mic. Yep. So we want the ball to finish in an orientation that's ball, pin, nearest edge. So the ball could be anywhere from my thumb yep. all the way over my head, out the building, that way, back yep. behind me. Anything to the right. Anything over here, and that is worth negative... Point two nine zero three shots. Mm. So you got to hit it, and it'll take. You hit that off spot. Score. That's correct. So it removes strokes. Well, and for the people who are listening at a home, a third of a shot almost. Yeah, it's huge. So for the people listening <laughs> at home, and you're wondering, well, okay, I hear you describe it. What does that mean? Well, let me just take you through a practical standpoint. So, Micah and I today we were on um, we were on hold number six. So the par four. Pins back left. Pins in the back left. Yeah. And so that's um, actually a pretty small BPN. It's actually got multiple edges. Oh shoot! Well, where was it? Where is the BPN? It's basically there? like if you just draw the corner. Okay. You're going to be pretty close to it. You either draw the back edge or the left edge. You okay. actually combine the left edge and the back edge because they're both four paces. Okay. Four and a half, five paces. I had it like anything. It's four and a half. One's four and one's five. It's pretty close to the same. Okay. Um. Well, then this scenario might not work, but I hit it. Uh, actually, it does work. It 100% does work. Um, so I, I ended up bombing it and hitting it greenside, like it, like literally a 30-yard chip. We'll get it there. And so um, my intent was not to hit the green. I didn't think I was going to hit it. In fact, I was looking like way short of where it actually was. And Mike was like, dude, that's your ball greenside. And I was like, oh, sick. I almost drove the green today. <laughs> um, and so ended up chipping it up to about six six feet. And so... By that definition, the POA, yep. I'm going to gain strokes on POA because it's close. Right. And I hit the BPN because it's in between uh, the pin and that nearest edge, which is that I had it between that that spine on the right. 
Right. So I hit the BPN, so that's minus a stroke, or minus, you know, whatever that number is. Nine zero three. I have my POA close, and then I... Six feet, it's, you're not even at point zero one shots. Correct. And then, I, uh, and then I lipped out, and I made it for par, but when we go back and look at the data, we can say, okay, you hit your BPN, you, right. your POA was close, Correct. and so now what do we need to work on? Well, it sounds like you missed your putt. So now this gives us tangible things to go work on later uh, on down bingo. the line. Bingo. And that's why we have it. Right, that's and that's one hole. It. And so we look through the entire round exactly. um, for, for where you're losing shots. And so that's it's basically anywhere on a certain side of the line. So the way we draw that, um, let's see if we can do this in here. I'm going to put this. The flag is going to be here. Let's see, Jack, let's try this one more time. The flag's going to be here. Oh, I keep trying to talk into the right side of this mic. Um, yeah, sorry, Tate. You're gonna have a uh, <laughs> you're gonna have an editing nightmare on this one. Uh, so <clears throat> let's go back to our same scenario. I'm waiting for Jack here. He's trying to make some adjustments. Keep Should on going, Scott. Talk through it. Okay. So um, when we're looking at ball pin nearest edge, we want to get the ball in that orientation. If your ball is between the pin and the nearest edge, now what is the nearest edge? So typically we think of um, the way strategy has typically been taught is that if the flag is on the right side of the green, you hit it to the left of the hole, hit it towards the middle of the green, right? If the pin's on the front, you hit it beyond the flag. If the pin's in the back, you hit it short of the flag. If the pin's on the left side of the green, you hit it to the right of the flag. That would leave the ball in the orientation of it's your ball, then the pin, then the nearest edge of the green. Of the green, though. That was the original design, right? Yep. My definition is ball pin nearest edge. A slope that exceeds eh, basically three degrees of slope, which is like people are like, well, how much is three degrees? If it looks kind of significant, it probably is. If you were putting across it and you're like, oh, that's a slider, it's It's be probably edge. it, right. <clears throat> so, and the faster the greens are, the more important it becomes to hit the BPN to some degree. Now, luckily on the tour, they're all the same speed. Um... But <clears throat> when you leave that ball in that position over and over again, you are securing a whole host of positive things in your favor. You're reducing, you're actually opening up options, which we'll talk a little bit on the next podcast. Uh, a quote that Elijah said that I think is just awesome. Um, but you're leaving yourself a whole host of options. You can do a lot of different things from there. Um, you have easy pitches and chips and putts and things like that by and large. Um, even if you're not on the green, right? You can be on the green. You don't have to be on the green. Uh, but when you get on the other side of that flag, if it's pin, ball, nearest edge, yes, you may be close to the hole, but if you continue to repeat that behavior, and I, I want it close. Don't get me wrong. Like, it needs to be close. You can't make putts if you're not. Um, but if I keep putting in that orientation over and over again, something bad's going to happen. You're basically short-siding yourself every right. time. Right. It's If you keep buying, you know, these stocks in the stock market that are these quick, you know, make quick bucks, like there's a chance that you're going to get caught with your pants down. Yeah. You're going to have something bad is going to happen even though you're making short-term gains. Right. And even if you make birdie there, you got away with one. I think that that's the biggest difference with people who are watching the tour is that they'll see these guys make birdies, 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 and then they go out and make a birdie, and you know they're like they're super excited. But it's like, how do I how do I make it look as easy as they do? Well, the people right. who do it at the at the highest level are setting themselves up for success easier. And you might be able to say like, Correct. well, they just hit everything close to the pin. Okay, there's Poa. But what about these long bombs that these guys are making? They probably hit the BPN and they just had a putt that it's, was, you know, that was really, able to get it in there. It's really so. pretty amazing uh, to see that right. to see that orientation. Right, right, right. Um, and we've talked about this in previous ones. So regular listeners, this is a you know, this may not be new for you, but uh, in Brody's book, uh, and there's some other research out there that supports this too, is um, that there's no difference between an uphill and a downhill putt on the tour in terms of make percentage. It's simply length. It's yeah. just length. Yeah. Um, These guys are so good at controlling their speeds, knowing what it takes to get right. it close to the hole. And they know that, that, that down. Point, and they know it's that really just length. Yeah, and they know that downhill putts break more than uphill putts. Yep. So like, yep. they just account for all of that when yep. they're making decisions, right? So, um, <clears throat> and, but in my data, guys make more putts 
from in the BPN than they do from without the BPN. And you're going, well, wait a second. You're separating out. You're saying that you, some putts are made more than others. Yes. And it has to do with the relationship of the pin and the slopes and the ball. Like, that relationship sometimes is a downhill putt. Back left pin that's close to the tier on one here or on same situation on the right, back right, but close to the tier there. If you're beyond, like, both of those putts, if you're in the BPN, you actually have downhill putts. Yeah. Sometimes being in the BPN has uphill putts. Sometimes it has downhill putts. And so that's actually the distinction that's being made is we are actually able to tease out, you are right, there is no difference between uphill and downhill putt. But and there is a difference between putting from within the BPN and from without the BPN. And here's the other thing that I just came up with off the top, and I want to know if it's true, because if it is, I think it's really profound. Essentially, if you are... Uh, essentially... If you're hitting the BPN 18 out of 18 times, essentially you're having putts that are all less than 3% of slope. 3% of slope. Uh, not necessarily, because you may go over another slope somewhere else. Okay, fair, fair enough. But like by and large, it feels you're like not, you're not going to be. You're have, not going taking over of, significant yes, slopes yes. by and large, even. You might, depending like if a green's got multiple tiers in it, right, significant right. slopes. You've got a big. If you're in a bunker and you got to go up over that, so there sure, may sure. be scenarios which you're in that. But if you're on the green, there's a good chance that you're not putting over a significant slope. Which is, I think, the reason <clears throat> for that make percentage, right? right? Is like it does increase over time. And if you have a basic chip or pitch, by and large, you can play a bump and run. You can play a high shot. You right. can play a low shot. Right. You can play a cutty one. You can pay, play one that spins. Right. Like you hit five iron, seven iron, eight iron, nine iron, whatever. So, <clears throat> but from the other side. We've reduced your options totally. significantly. Totally. And in so doing, like, even trying to get that one close to the hole be can become a challenge. Um, so it's ball pin nearest edge, and it's not as simple. It is correct to say play to the center of the green, It is, but it can be entirely incorrect depending on the slopes and where they are. Let's talk about OP real quick before we yeah. log off here. So OP is opposite the pin. So the way it's traditionally taught, if the pin is on the right, you play to the opposite side of the hole, opposite the pin. So that would be pins on the right, you hit it to the left. Mm -hmm. Pins on the left, you hit it to the right. Pretty straightforward stuff. Uh, one of the big evidence for that was a couple of years ago, I think it was 2021, uh, at the PGA Championship, you had um, Matthew Wolf and Bryson DeChambeau combined only hit, it was on Saturday, only hit three fairways. Yeah. And they had the lowest score and they were leading the golf tournament. And all these guys in the booth were like, oh, they're just bombing and gouging. I was like, nope, they're not bombing and gouging. They actually have the best angles in. Mm. I think they hit like 16 OPs on average between the two of them. That's the cool thing about this data is because they are nobody playing else the really, best angles. Well, nobody else really knows about it. And so it only validates our data and it only invalidates the people who are, you know, saying, that, oh, they're just, you know, they're just bombing it and, and chipping it up there. The only thing that hitting it farther does is it gives you the opportunity to improve your proximity on first attempt. Well, the only thing that hitting it in the fairway does but we know is that's gives you a only, cleaner lie. Like right. that's, For each foot that you hit it closer, it's worth 0 .0059. Yeah. For but, every 10 feet you hit it closer, it's zero five nine. Each time you hit the BPN, it's worth negative. 0.29, like right out of the gate, like yeah. a third of a shot versus five one hundredths of a shot for being ten feet closer. Now let's uh, let's also describe the caveat for OP, right? Because it's not necessarily if the flag is on the left, you hit it to the right. We're playing the OP. Years. So let's say you have, and tell me if I'm explaining this wrong. I don't want to. I don't want to say it wrong. Let's just say you've got a big circular green with a spine right down the middle, right? Correct. Let's say the flag is going to be on the inside part of that middle spine, but on the left-hand side. Inside. Yeah, so it's close. Is it so? It's close to the spine. Close to the spine. Closer on, to the spine than it the, is to the edge of the green. Correct, but on the left-hand side. Correct. Yep. And that spine runs right down the middle. So, in traditionally, you would say, okay, the flag's on the left. Hit it to the right. right? Correct. But in this scenario. We're going to be hitting it to the left because the, the pin is on the technically on the right, right when you're talking about the BPN. Correct. So you're going to be hitting it on the left, and that creates a Bingo. better angle into the Bingo. pin on the middle left. And it makes sense, right? So if you're having to come across that spine, hitting a shot across that spine, a couple things happen. A, it's really hard to get it close to the hole. you got to somehow navigate over that spine. Um, two, you're limited in terms of the options that, A, you feel like you can hit. Like, you get this sense of, like, man, I really can't hit. Like, I'm kind of trapped here. And B, unless that is a shot that you can hit, you might be forced to 
hit a shot that you can't hit or you try to hit a shot that you shouldn't hit right. in order to try to get it in those spots. So um, there's a direct correlation between when you miss the OP, your proximity goes up. Mm-hmm. G- going up meaning gets worse. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and so in a left, it's funny, it's a left pin, you actually need to hit it left Yep. of a left pin. Uh, a couple of years ago, I think it was last year actually at Pebble, uh, Jason Day and Zalatoris were kind of coming down the stretch. This is when Zalatoris almost won the tournament. Um, and there was a left pin like that. It was a green that was kind of like like a three-leaf clover shape, like this, like like that. Yeah. And the pin was over here, and there's a big spine right there. So the pin was very much on the left side of the hole uh, of the green. By significant yardage, but it was right next to that big tear in the green. Zalatoris hits it to the right, misses the OP, tries to get it close, the ball runs off, goes into, no, he got it into the BP, actually he didn't get a BP in, hits that ridge and rolls down to the right. So now he's got to putt up over this ridge. Um, <clears throat> and because he was missing the OP, like, I've got to try to get it close here. Jason Day actually barely misses the fairway bunker on the left, almost hits it in the ravine. In the left hand, I think he's in the first cut of rough, holes it. He was in the OP, and therefore he got it closer, happened to go in. Therefore he was able to get it closer, have a better angle, and play a better shot. So, like, that angle doesn't make – it didn't fit the original narrative of, right. like, the pins on the left, you play from the right. Actually, right. it's exactly the situation that you described, and he hold it. And people are like, oh, they're just so lucky. I was like – Actually, it's like when you look at mathematically, it's not all that surprising for him to have hold that shot. Well, and let's uh, let's let's uh, use this example to wrap it up. So let's use my example with the circular green spine going right down the middle, flag on the yep. left side of the spine, yep. uh, but just barely off the middle. So if you hit it to the right side and you got to put over that spine, just if you're listening to this podcast, put yourself in that situation where you're having to put over that spine, right? probably really hard to get the speed right not only are you gonna have to go over the spine you're gonna have to go down the spine on the other side so it's gonna be even harder you're it's gonna run off right you don't need depending on where you hit a hit it you're either gonna be putting uphill or downhill so you can see how that putt would be super uncomfortable now let's do it to the other side if you hit the bp bpn from the op on the left side you're gonna be playing with no significant slopes you're gonna be well, very few very few you're probably going to be hitting it, uh, you know, let's just say it's on the top left part of the spine. You're going to be hitting it uphill without any significant slopes. You're going to be able to get it closer to the hole, even if you two putt. Even if you had a downhill. And tap it in, right? Right. But the percentage of three putting it is going to be significantly higher from the right side of the green hitting it over Correct. the spine than if you hit the OP and, and BPN on and the left. And if you had missed the green, not getting it up and down. So you didn't hit totally. it close and you missed your mark. Totally, totally. And so <clears throat> it's... And you know what? Sometimes, like people are like, so you're telling me like I can miss the green here? I was like, yeah, you can. Totally. No, you, especially like, on par fives. Right. Like, well, I'm trying to hit it on the green. It's like I get that, but like we need to make sure that we're in the BPN more often than we're not. So, are you picking a shot that allows you to end up in the BPN more often than not? But you also have to keep people. So I, I consulted with a university, and the coach was like. But, like, what if he hits it to, like, 75 feet? I was like, Coach, there's three variables here, not one. Yes, the BPN is the kingpin. But, like, if you hit it to 75 feet, I'd rather you miss the BPN and be at 10 feet. But you can't continually miss BPNs. And the purpose of that— If you do that, you're going to get caught at some point, which is why Cameron Smith couldn't beat— Scheffler last year. Well, and what's interesting is you mentioned that college coach, and she's like, well, what if, you know, they hit it to 75 feet? Well— why is that a bad thing? Like, on a par 5, we're talking about 13. Let's say you decide to go for it. Now, you know, proximity is a number, but if you hit a BPN, it's a check mark. So even if you decide to go for it on a par 5 yeah. and you miss it, but you miss it on the BPN, your up and down chances are probably significantly right. higher. Well, and this is where, you know... Um, is that still a birdie? Right. People are like, oh my gosh, this sounds so complicated. No. It's not complicated at all. No. This is why, like, this is why my book comes to an abrupt end. It's super thin. Like, you can actually see it up behind us. My first book is to Jack's right, right there. Yeah. The Champions Playbook. Um, That one's much thicker. And then... Up, he's got to reach up higher. It's significantly smaller, about a <coughs> third of the size. <laughs> right. Like, there's all this meat early on, and then all of a sudden it's like, come and see me. It's like, it's just, 
you can get so much into the weeds with all of it. Right. And people will look at it if we finish with that example that you used with the spine and we got to be on the left of a left flag. People are going, well, I'm not very good at my chipping. It's like, uh, ding, 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 ding. Something for you to work on. Right. Right. And then it's also, we're back, to, I always tie it back to the first book, which is like, okay, once you know that that's the place to be, then what shot do you pick to hit it there? Mm. And for my higher handicappers, they're like, well, I can't get hit my five iron there. I was like, so, again, we're back to intent. If you cannot control the outcome of that ball, maybe you shouldn't hit a five iron in yeah. this situation. Maybe you should hit an a seven iron short of the green, or maybe you can hit a seven iron like in the BPN over there to the left, but like barely get on the front edge of the green. Well, and you might also be thinking too, if you're, if you're thinking like Scott said, being like, this is so complicated. Like, I don't need to learn this. I'm not good enough to learn this yet. It's like, if you learn it, if you can learn it, which you can, if you really try, what does this do for you? You can get better quicker yeah. because you're going to have more options, right? You're not going to have to. You're not going to have to hit all these hero shots over and over again, right? So if you can actually learn this, and let's say you have, you, know, you can just get it straight in some kind of direction. I don't care if you're thinning it and running it or fatting it and and having it go thirty yards down the down the way. Like as long as you are getting in those areas, you're going to have more opportunities to make better shots right and get it right. in the hole in fewer strokes right it's a game of averages exactly and if you continue to play the averages well you're gonna be in a good positive position i think dude that's perfect i think we should just leave it yeah right there. and and you can do this it's not all that complicated no i had a college player come down and we showed it to him in the first two holes by the time we get to the third hole he's got to figure it out right he knows how right. to draw them he even knows how to draw ones where like there's two edges yeah like it, it can get it seems to get a little complex but like once you get the principle, you can apply it anywhere and everywhere. And he's a kid who gets super amped up. Uh -huh. And his coach, his swing coach from Colorado sent him to see us. And he finishes. He's like, dude, there's actually – my rounds make a whole lot more sense now. Yeah. I make seven birdies, and then, I like, I'll make two doubles and a triple, and I'll shoot one over. Right. And I don't know what, what happened. And he's like, as I think about it, and there's a lot of sense. Yeah. I just – I can make sense in my rounds and like I can see yeah. it's one of those things too that the writing that, on the wall uh it's one of those things where if you just do it two or three times you can get the hang of it so this might sound confusing if you're listening to this on the podcast but I promise you if you give me and Scott three holes for you to go out there find your nearest edge yep. put it in BP and ball ball uh excuse me ball ball pin pin nearest, nearest edge. edge sorry I had a brain yep. fart there um if you put it to ball pin nearest edge I promise you if you can do that for three holes and really understand it and try and put it into action, you will shoot lower scores. Guaranteed. Guaranteed. And if you can't see us, and really you shouldn't, you should go <laughs> see Elijah Yeah. out on the golf course. Yep. He'll show this to you. Love He's it. incredible out there. I can't wait to talk about him in the next podcast. Love it. Well, that's a perfect segue to the next one. Uh, thank you guys so much for checking in with us here. Uh, remember, if you're on Apple Podcasts, pause it, give us a five-star, write us a review. That'd be wonderful. It helps other people when they search for golf podcasts. Ours will pop up first, so we really appreciate it. If you're on Spotify, uh, give us a follow. And if you're on YouTube, and if you haven't watched us on YouTube, Go ahead and uh, search No Mulligans Podcast into YouTube and check us out over there. You get to see oh, the studio where coming, we're at. we got swag coming, dude. We've got swag coming. We're going to announce that in the next podcast. Yes. Uh, so if you guys are Woo! listeners of the No Mulligans Podcast, former Champions Playbook listeners, uh, you got to check out the swag that we're going to be releasing soon. And so guess what? You need that. to come to our Podcasting in the Pub event in two weeks. By the time yep. you hear this, it'll be one, one week. One week away. It'll be at 6.30 p.m. in the pub. You can find it on our scheduler. We'll put the link to that in the show notes. Um, come and join us for that. Don't miss out. Food specials, the whole deal. You're going to see some of the swag in person. We'll be wearing it. We'll have some for sale. Love it. Come on. We're going to do Love it, love, love it. 2023. There's only one rule. Shoot a lower score. Thanks for listening to the No Mulligans podcast. We'll see you on the next one. Peace. There's no rule. Shoot a lower score. There's one rule.